Okay, hello everyone. Um, thank you for joining us on uh, Tuesday the, uh, of Milky Way week. And today we have our first keynote uh, talk of the week, and it's uh, by Professor Mary Putman. Um, Mary is at uh, Columbia University, and she has a lot many connections who are here today at this uh, uh, at, at this uh, for this program, um, so uh, I am quite happy to be able to introduce her. Um, I think we all know about her 2012 review with um, Jess Work and um, uh, <laughs> was it Josh Peak? Yes. Okay. Um, and Mary was the first author, and it has it's the seminal review with this beautiful. Uh, 3D rendering of the Milky Way halo that just kind of revolutionized our view uh, of the Milky Way. Um, I won't go on um, about all of Mary's accomplishments, but um, uh, I was really impressed to see a, a very nice and uh, very, uh, you know, very uh, visual um, paper she put out about um, gas stripping of Milky Way halo satellites. And I hope she talks about that today. So I'm going to turn it over to Mary, and I also uh, want to talk about our panel. Um, and today we have um, a panel discussion with, with Mary, Gertina Besla, Edmund hodges Cook, Chris Hauk, and Freka Vanderford. So Mary, I am going to let you start. Um, thank you for uh, offering to give a keynote speak uh, uh, talk. Okay, thanks very much, Ben. Uh, so I have a lot I was thinking about getting through today. And so because of that, I, I would love to use a Zoom poll, but with KITP, that's tricky. Uh, but Jess has very nicely set up a Menti poll for, for me. Um, and so I'll go ahead and post that now. And then this is basically just making sure I get to what everyone wants the most. So if you have any opinion in terms of what is definitely covered. I'll get to that slide and give you some more details on that, but I wanted to post it right now in terms of you can vote for multiple things. And then in, in a couple of slides, I'll get to the one to describe those in more detail. If you're like, I don't understand this and wait till I get to that slide and we can, we can talk about it. Okay, so the question I was asked to talk about today is what does the Milky Way tell us about the CGM? My immediate reaction to this question is, why is it not, why, what does the CGM of the Milky Way tell us about it? Because I typically work more locally, but um, indeed I understand why the question is such. Um, just to set the scene just a little bit for everyone who comes from a wide variety of redshifts and interests, um, we're talking about our Milky Way, of course, the Bard Spiral Galaxy. We're located about eight kiloparsecs out. So whenever we're studying our CGM, we have to consider that bias. That's something Yang Zheng is an expert on and she'll be doing a tutorial on Wednesday on this. We are set within a, a group environment. Um, it is a very low mass group though. It's a loose group, 3.2 times 10 to the 12 solar masses. It's the best local group mass estimate we're talking about. So really two large spirals and a large collection of dwarf galaxies. And then related to the question that Jess and Yang posed, this, this last plot here is showing you stellar mass versus star formation rate. This is from Bland, Hawthorne, and Gerhard. Um, the cross here is showing the Milky Way on this plot. And then they chose a bunch of SDSS analogs here as the red points. Um, so you can get an idea in terms of where it lies in overall star formation stellar mass space compared to other galaxies and the red and the red and the blue here. Um, the other point they made, which I decided to go ahead and add, is that when you plot this in color absolute magnitude space, this population spreads out dramatically. So that's related to the question they're posing, is the Milky Way typical? Um, I would say it roughly is, but as you can see, uh, it, it does spread out quite a bit depending on what parameters you actually plot there. 
Make sure, of course, that you also pay attention to these people this week. As you can see, they're very clearly experts in the field, and I may get in trouble for this picture. But anyway, um, Jess, Young, uh, Filippo uh, are, are other people in terms of thinking about the observations in particular. I'm not the simulation people I don't mention here. I also don't have great pictures of them like I do of these, these, this group. Okay, so what does the Milky Way tell us about the CGM? So I outlined several things that I would like to go through that I think the Milky Way in particular says something about that you can't easily do for other galaxies. Um, and these options are what is in that Menti poll. I wasn't sure I would get through everything, so I wanted to see if there was a clear, oh, I definitely want you to cover this. So if you, have, if you care, you can go to that at this stage and make a vote and you can vote for multiple things. I was going to right away sketch out the picture of the Milky Way with the cold high velocity clouds at within 10 kiloparsecs of the disk. And most of the ionized gas we think too is close to the disk. But then an extended largely ionized halo medium with the Magellanic system coming through. But just nicely put up that picture already. I was going to show off my Zoom whiteboard skills and try to draw and everything. Um, but I, we have, you have that scene and those slides are posted so you can get a general picture in your head from there. Um, in terms of what the options are, in terms of what I'll talk about and what I'll just naturally go through in this order if there isn't a large preference. First, that the CGM clouds come in a very wide range of sizes and are multi-phase. And you could say, well, we know this from other galaxies as well, but we have direct evidence in the case of the Milky Way for this. The mass in the CGM is not always as significant. Um, so this is important because, of course, one of the reasons the CGM has caught a lot of attention in galaxy evolution is because we found that there's a lot of baryons wrapped up in it. Going to our local Milky Way and also M31 at some level, we're, we're finding there could be some discrepancy here, either just locally or maybe at Z equals zero in general. Interaction between the satellites and the CGM, this is key because in the local environment, we have a great census of the satellites and we also have the Magellanic system so we can watch that process directly. There's also just more data to sort out the difference between a group medium and that of an individual galaxy. And again, we're talking about a very low mass group here, uh, but this is also something of interest to many people and myself, and it's related to the paper I recently put out. So I put this as another, another option. And then finally, uh, we can learn about the halo magnetic field by looking at the clouds within our own Milky Way halo. And this is something that, I would like to advertise some work that a student is doing, if possible, on providing insight into this. You should definitely talk to Brian Gainsler on the observational side of this further, though, as well, if I get to that. Okay, um, can I ask now, Joss, if there's any clear bias in terms of the Menti poll? So, yeah, I just posted a JPEG, uh, a screenshot of the results. Uh, it looks like the first place uh, by you know, a substantial margin is cloud sizes and multi-phase. <laughs> the second is, oh, we got a few more votes, interaction between satellites and the CGM. Uh, the third I see is difference between CGM and group medium. Fourth is mass in the Milky Way. And fifth is insight into magnetic fields. So almost exactly as you have written. Okay. Well, maybe, um, maybe what I'll do is... Uh... I might just go in order then, and then we'll see if I don't get to the to the uh, la the data to sort out group medium and individual galaxy. We can always bring our panel in to discuss this as well, because some of them have thought about this for sure. Okay, so let's talk about CGM clouds and the wide range of sizes they have, and the fact that we see that the Milky Way CGM is multi-phase. Of course, I have to show this plot at least once. Um, so this is showing the distribution of high velocity gas in our Milky Way halo across the sky. And so what you're seeing here, the shades are the neutral hydrogen. So the densest material ranging in density from about 10 to the 18 to 10 to the 20 in H1 column density. And then the circles here are representing ionized gas detections. Uh, in particular, we have O6 silicon lines and IHVCs. This is from Lerner, Hawk, et al. I'm sorry, I don't remember the other authors. Um, and so what you can see is that 
the, the gas is multi-phase. You see the multiple sizes here. You see large complexes together with small clouds. These little crosses here are the compact high velocity clouds detected with a, a more sensitive and higher resolution survey. So that's what all these crosses are. And you can see structures follow each other in velocity largely. Um, we can look at the Magellanic system and we see the ionized gas largely has the same color as the dense gas detected in emission. This is the tail of the Magellanic stream here. So this is, this is the only complex here that is at very large distance out in our halo medium. So this would be 50 to 60 kiloparsecs. And then going out to the tail, um, the models, and Gertina can talk about this more if people are interested, the tail has been found to extend even further towards the plane here and also have um, be at distances potentially out to 100 kiloparsecs, possibly even a little bit for, further out, depending on the actual coming in for the first time model, et cetera. Um, and so you can, the other thing is these complexes are very local. They're within 10 kiloparsecs, so low Z heights uh, within our halo. And again, you see this is complex C that the ionized gas follows the denser gas and there's also uh, some compact clouds associated with this as well. Um, so this is uh, this plot itself shows that the clouds come in a wide range of sizes and are clearly multi-phase because we're getting that medium both on top of the H1 clouds as well as next to it, showing it has this extended ionized medium around the dense core. This is a more recent data set from Richter et al. showing the cost results of for the ionized gas. And both all of these are in LSR velocity. If you're interested, I can show you a GSR version later. Here you're seeing that we've filled in a number of sight lines. And if you do an overlay with the H1, you find largely the same thing that most of the ionized gas is following what the cold densest gas is doing. This is one area that's particularly interesting in terms of it just being a large ionized complex without a lot of H, uh, H1 at similar velocities. Um, but other, otherwise, you generally see an H1 structure with the large ionized components. I actually, I wanted to mention too, I'm actually happy to take questions during my talk. I know we haven't traditionally done this and Slack is the place we can do this, but if you wanna raise your hand, I'll, I'll just see you come up and I'll, I'll take your question. I might wait till a pause point, but I'm quite happy to take questions during the talk just for a clarity or some other important thing you think should be mentioned or asked about now. Okay, and so then the advantage of the Milky Way though, is you can keep going to our higher resolution and get very deep. And indeed, when you do higher resolution observations, you find there are clumps within the large clouds, there's additional small clouds around it. Um, these two examples here are from the Arecibo survey, GALFA. So we're going about a factor of four to five better resolution with similar sensitivity to what you saw in that previous map in terms of the H1, cold H1 complexes. This is the tail of complex C, so we're at a Z height of about two to four kiloparsecs. And so we're seeing that it's breaking up into these series of smaller clouds, but you also have some larger clouds present. This is almost certainly complex C is thought to be accreting onto the Milky Way disk currently. So this could be, you know, where it's currently breaking up or, you know, what we've talked about in the conference, this could be also where we're seeing some cooling going on as it slows and, and, and is pressure confined and is able to start cooling. Um, so this is an interesting thing in terms of how we would actually sort out if there's actually some cooling going on along with the destruction that we know is going on. This is the tail of the Magellanic Stream. As I said, we don't know the exact distance to this, but, you know, it's probably at least 100 kiloparsecs. Very clearly, the destruction of CGM, cold CGM gas, but again, is it possible that we're also getting some cooling going on there? We can then look at the distributions of sizes, et cetera. Because we actually have a distance, we can convert that to a physical size, work out a volume density, and I'll think, also think about the pressure, assuming they're in pressure equilibrium with a hot halo medium. So the tail of complex C, so lower halo, three few kiloparsecs, we have a range of sizes from this sample, about 25 to 100 parsecs. Volume density is about 0.01 to 0.1. This is typical for what people have found for these high velocity clouds. 
And then this is showing you pressure, that pressure assumption of, of equilibrium and what you then get for that density of the halo, assuming a 10 to 6 Kelvin halo medium. And then doing the same thing for the tail of the Mandelin extreme, it's further away, so you have larger size distribution, and then you get much lower volume densities and lower pressures as well. The halo densities here, I would say, are relatively high for what we would expect out there as well. And so that just goes to show, I mean, do we really think that the tail of Mandelin extreme is in pressure equilibrium? I'm not sure. I was actually encouraged by what someone said that you commonly, that assumption can work fine, um, but I'd, I'd love to hear more about that. So this is one example of, you know, where you can actually catalog individual clouds and look at their overall distribution of properties. You can go to even higher resolution, though, of course, and the clumps just get smaller uh, is generally what we find. And this is just a sampling of the work that's been done using synthesis arrays to get to even higher resolution. This is showing you a compact high velocity cloud where they point out some of the subclumps they see within that cloud. This is work where they looked at uh, along absorption line sight lines and found little dense clumps. And this is work where um, the, it's in the leading arm of the Magellanic system, and the data, has been, the data has been combined with single dish results, which is key to really understand what's going on at all scales. So the top, and these are sub-arc minute resolution. Um, so the top is showing you the highest resolution map. And then this is showing you what the single dish alone gives you, right? Um, so you can see that the variety in terms of what you're seeing, this is just the Parkes radio telescope. This is combined with the compact array data here, um, going to sub arc minute resolution. And then when you're thinking about physical scales, I know that's what the theorists wanna know. It totally depends on where the complex is. You can quote that you're getting to sub parsec levels, but with that, you have to be in that very lower halo, about one kiloparsecs up. Once you get up to things that we think are more Magellanic system, getting out to interesting 50 kiloparsecs type thing, then you're, right now we're limited to about five to 15 parsec structures that we're getting down to. Um, so it totally depends on where you are in the halo in terms of what physical scale you're actually capturing. And I'd be curious if the simulations actually expect a difference depending on the density and nature of the halo medium the clouds are moving through would you expect a difference in that relative size scale? So in terms of the future of, uh, of assessing halo clump size, I just wanted to mention the gas cap survey. So this is gonna cover 13,000 square degrees of sky at 30 arc second resolution. So this is what we need to really assess what's going on with the clump size distribution across a large region of sky, high resolution, high sensitivity, large region of sky. And the results have started to come out for this, so far largely for the small Magellanic cloud. This is a paper by McClure Griffiths et al, where I've added some, some inlays to some filamentary features in the small Magellanic cloud. So this is, but this is also capturing the halo gas. So we'll be able to look at this, the clump size distribution in quite a bit of detail. And I think what's key here is that we apply the same cataloging method to both the simulations and the observations. So we're actually comparing things one to one and seeing what, what we see observationally means physically. Are there any quick questions on the H1 and clump size such? Okay, um, just continuing then in terms of the multi-phase and size of features is the ionized gas. So let me give you a quick overview of that. And there's many people in the audience that can say more about this. I, I, I I'll apologize now. I do not definitely have a complete set of references for each of these. So I apologize if I missed your work, but feel free to mention it in the Slack, please. Um, so going back to the 06 from Fuse, Sembach et al., this gives you an idea of the range of density for the 06 for the Milky Way halo. We see everything from 10 to the 13.5 to 10 to the 14.5. This stuff would be associated with the Magellanic system. This stuff would be lower halo. So again, the thinking in his paper, and I think most people still think this is that this is the clouds interacting with that hot halo medium partially. That's why you're getting this. We can look at the silicon 
lines. This is the work of Zeng et al. Uh, I don't have a plot of Richter et, et al. showing the distribution for the high velocity gas, for, but for the low velocity gas that is thought to be in the halo as well. Um, this is the type of variation we see in that silicon density. So again, we're seeing a fairly narrow distribution of densities, in my opinion, um, going over 0.6 dex largely when you go across the sky. And this just, again, shows you the wealth of information we can get for the Milky Way. Uh, we have so many sight lines that we can start to look at cloud structure, overall density variation, et cetera. Then the tricky part is sorting out exactly where that gas is, which is a, a big piece of work in itself. Then in terms of zooming in and looking at the ionized gas structure at the smallest scales possible, what you can do is look at structures that have multiple sight lines within them. And that's, again, I'm referencing Yang Zheng's work, but there's Chris Hawk on our panel did work with this related to globular clusters as well. Um, so in this case, we're looking at stars within M33 and using it to study the foreground gas. And so what she found is this type of variation. These are the points from the M33 results uh, using the stars there for the angular separation. And then this is work from Collins et al. looking at the silicon three. So again, I would, I would argue this is not large variation on small scales. I'll let Jess, would you argue with that? No, so I would, I would say um, we don't see a lot of large scale variation in the ionized gas overall. Um, and this physical separation here depends again exactly where you are. Um, one parsec to one kiloparsec is roughly what we're looking at for the gas we detected along this sight line. Okay, um, are there questions now before I move on to the, I'm gonna move on to the mass in the CGM. Yeah, we're, we're getting great questions uh, for the panel, so uh, keep on going. Okay, I'll, I'll yeah. stop. I'll just, um, I'll just look for blue hands. I, as my teaching, uh, trying to be interactive, is coming in here, <laughs> trying to bring everyone in. Uh, the mass in the CGM is not always as significant. Uh, so this is related to when we look at the total amount of gas we're finding in the Milky Way halo and, and M31 at some level as well we're not finding as much. And right now I'm just taking the numbers from Zeng et al, where she put everything, worked out that mass if you scale everything with the same numbers and have within 75 kiloparsecs. And it's a greater than, than value in all cases, but for the Milky Way CGM, we're finding generally a value that's 10 to the nine solar masses are greater. Same thing, M31 is finding something similar. And Chris can say more about that on the panel. And then for cost halos, of course, an order of magnitude larger. Um, so immediately there you say, okay, there's something weird about the Milky Way, but these mass estimates are pretty dodgy, you could say as well, right? <laughs> so you could put that, but there's multiple other signs that the Milky Way is weird. Here's one that was suggested back with Tumlinson et al. in 2011, just looking at the 06 results and using the fuse 06 results, just looking at a typical column density the Milky Way was lying right about here. And you can say, well, maybe that's where it was supposed to be. And this is just a typical column density detected, but already the Milky Way was starting to appear like it was a little bit low compared to what was being found. More recently for this type of temperature gas, this has been done much more carefully by Hannah Bish and she has a beautiful new results video you can check out to find out more about this. But what the project did, this was a Quasar project that Jess and Josh Peak and Young were involved with as well, um, where you looked at matched halo stars and QSOs, so they're both very close on the sky, and then looked at the column density difference of the carbon-4 absorption. Uh, this little schematic is kind of showing you this is the inner region where we had the halo stars and then going out to a very distant QSO. Generally then what she found then is that the Milky Way covering fraction of CGM carbon four is significantly down from other galaxies, even from M31. So the, this shaded region is for the data for the other galaxies in terms of covering fraction with radius. And here is depending, depending on whether you count the Magellanic system, these are the points for the Milky Way, just indicating that the covering fraction in the outer halo beyond eight kiloparsecs 
is very, very low for the Milky Way compared to what we see in other galaxies. So another clear signature that the Milky Way is somewhat low in terms of CGM content. Then the other point uh, in terms of the Milky Way potentially being odd is that the cold H1 gas is also less than other galaxies. And with this, I've started with the M31 data because Chris Hawk did a very nice paper here showing you the red are sight lines for M31 and showing what we have for, I, I hope you can read this. It's, this is column density. You might not be able to depending on how big your screen is versus impact parameter or distance. And then this below is covering fraction versus distance. And so you can see these are the cost halo results, the gray points, they're very high. We'll focus on within 100 kiloparsecs. Um, so very high values for the H1 and then in column density and then also for M31 very down, this is the Magellanic system. And then in terms of covering fraction as well, the cost halos points are higher. Um, for the Milky Way, uh, you can think about the high velocity clouds that have a 37% covering fraction for columns greater than this. Uh, this but when you, we now know that this gas, because this was a northern survey, this is almost all gas that's within 10 kiloparsecs. So that would be a point maybe about here on here. So again, and when you think about within 10 kiloparsecs, when you're looking at other galaxies, um, within 10 kiloparsecs, very often you could almost be looking through the disk, depending on where, what you're looking at exactly, and that data is very limited. Uh, but in general, this is not an isolated problem. If you look at the deep H1 surveys, halo gas, et cetera, we are not finding an extended CGM medium above 10 to the 18 in column. Um, so it's very possible this is a Z equals zero problem in general and not just a Milky Way M31 one. So this is something we can think about looking into more in the future because these deep H1 surveys aren't still not finding this stuff that cost halos is getting. So in terms of the mass and the CGM not always being as significant, is this a generic Z equals zero problem? Is there an environment link? Or is there still a problem with how we are comparing things? It's possible we're just not, don't have it quite right in terms of how we're comparing being within the Milky Way and the local environment, which has some velocity confusion problems we always need to deal with. Um, so at, in the discussion afterwards, if we want, we can do a poll on what people think is potentially going on here. We'll see if people are interested in that. Okay, I'm gonna go on to the interaction of satellites with the CGM. And of course I have to show you this picture and I don't have to have an acknowledgement here because this is my old data, which I still think is beautiful. Um, just to set the scene for everyone, the Magellanic system, the interaction of the Magellanic system with the Milky Way CGM. This is the large Magellanic cloud, small Magellanic cloud, leading arm coming off here and the tail going off here. The clouds are moving in this direction roughly right in this direction. Um, so this is a very beautiful system in terms of studying how satellites lose their gas as they interact with, with a CGM material. And I actually only have this slide on this, so we can talk about this more afterwards if you're interested. Some of the data we have that help support what's going on with the RAM pressure stripping, the cloud interaction with the halo medium, H1 cloud structure, looking at head tail clouds, um, this is, my, some of my work and also for et al. The absorption lines, I don't think Andy Fox is at this meeting, but he's done beautiful work mapping the ionized gas distribution across the Magellanic system. And we find that there's a lot of mass present potentially, as well as a very high cross section. You can also then tell uh, that there is some interaction with clouds with the halo medium is it's likely from, from that work. And then finally, from the simulations, in particular LMC stripping simulations. This is work by Manir Salem with, working with Gertina Besla, where you can see this is the observations. The contours represent the stellar distribution and then the gas is the shades. So you can see there's an offset between the gas and the stars here. And this is his simulation where he's able to repro reproduce that offset of the gas from the stars with ram pressure stripping as the system plows through a Milky Way halo medium. So there's a lot we could talk about with this system, but this is one where we're capturing it directly. This is the process 
of how satellites lose their gas to a larger galaxy within the circumgalactic medium. Okay, so then you can say, what about the rest of them? Um, so there's actually 119 dwarf galaxies now within two megaparsecs. This is amazing. I mean, the number of dwarf galaxies in our local environment has increased substantially over the years, and this has been key in terms of understanding what those initial building blocks of galaxies look like, um, understanding the missing satellites problem, et cetera, et cetera. But the other thing you can do with this is think about their gas content and what is going on in terms of a satellite's interaction with the halo medium. And so this is something I, I did with Jenna Grisovich a long time ago, looked at the gas content of satellite galaxies relative to the Milky Way and M31. But the time was ripe to do this again. And others have done this as well, Blitz and Robichaud, um, Thinking back, if you go way back, people thought about this way, way back, but now we have a huge set of satellites to think about this. And we can also think about, okay, what about the local group itself? What is the local group doing in terms of playing a role? So this is showing you the distance to the Milky Way or M31, whichever is actually closer. And this is the virial radius, blue is the Milky Way and red is M31. And so all of these open symbols represent non-detections. All of the filled in symbols are detections. And so what you can see is that within the virial radius of these galaxies, they're almost all non-detections. 80 of the 85 galaxies within the virial radii of M31 or the Milky Way do not have gas. So there's a clear distant dependent mechanism potentially going on here to explain that fact, right? That we have all of these galaxies are stripped or do not have gas any longer. And the ones that do have gas, these are largely more massive galaxies. These are the odd dwarf ellipticals of M31, LMC, SMC, whether you would even have these on the plots, these are very large uh, dwarf galaxies. So those are the ones that are able to retain gas are largely the more massive satellites. Just a quick zoom in on that plot. This just shows you the names of all the satellites and shows you the wealth of data we have here. This, this slope here, this is due to the fact that um, we're using survey data. That's the other reason to take this on again. We have deeper survey data and this reproduces this distance dependence with H1 mass. That's why you see that line here of increasing limits. But all of the limits, these are the lowest detected H1 masses, right? And so we're at about 10 to the five and these are the odd dwarf ellipticals. So almost all the limits, except for just a couple, are lower than any detected dwarf galaxy out there. So then you can say, okay, this is a distant dependent quenching mechanism. You can think of mechanisms that might cause that. Tidal forces, they're not strong enough at the large radii of these dwarf galaxies, including their paragalactic hunt, and their stellar distribution is not disturbed at all. Um, star formation, stellar feedback, not on its own, this is some work by Emmerich et al. and others have shown it's unlikely that they can quench from this alone. Um, and it's also not a distant dependent mechanism, though there could be some link as, a, as the dwarf galaxies go through a CGM, the gas being compressed and star formation being triggered. Reionization for the small ones. Um, this is an important one to consider in the case of these dwarfs because they are quite small, many of them. But the distance dependence immediately makes you wonder, okay, but what is going on? Because there's this distance dependence. This will be left to future surveys. Do we actually see ultra faint galaxies at much larger distances? Then we can come back to um, reionization leading to the effect we currently see for many of them, at least. And then as I'll talk about now, ram pressure stripping, this seems like the most likely mechanism in particular for the ones that are a little bit more massive. So then the question is, is the CGM actually dense enough to do this to the dwarf galaxies? So it used to be in terms of thinking about the orbits of dwarf galaxies and assessing ram pressure stripping that there was only four dwarfs that we could play this game with, excluding the Magellanic system. So, but now with Gaia, we have lots of proper motions and we can get out orbits. So this is Adrian Price Whalen did the models for this paper where we calculated the halo density required at paragalacticum for instantaneous stripping. So this is a very simple estimate. Um, it's basically showing you it has to be 
it could be this dense, but it could be even lower density, right? Because you also are gonna have some continuous stripping as the, as the satellites are moving through the halo medium. Um, we know that the halo medium is clumpy, for instance. So this is a very simple estimate. What halo density would be required at Paragalacticon for instantaneous stripping? And here you have that Paragalacticon versus the halo density required. And so generally you're seeing a trend here, right? The, the lowest mass dwarf galaxies represented by the velocity dispersion are more only require very low halo densities where the more massive dwarfs require a bit higher halo densities. What you can do is over plot the expectations for the halo density of the Milky Way. And this comes from simulations. What you have here, the, the red is the simulation of Zhang et al. And this is, uh, this has the mass that we expect for the Milky Way at about 1.4 times 10 to the 12 solar masses and a virial radius going up 250 kiloparsecs. The blue is work that um, Yang worked on the, the foggy results. And so this is a lower mass galaxy. It's at 4.9 times 10 to the 11. But it's useful to put on for comparison. We're also showing here, this is a very high resolution simulation that you get a wider spread in the types of densities you could potentially get with the higher resolution, which is an interesting result in itself, but not, not something I'll talk about here. Um, but the bottom line in terms of stripping is that 80% are consistent with being stripped by a Milky Way halo medium. If you use the simulation that is more representative of the Milky Way, the pink here, the vast majority could be stripped using this simple calculation of what would be required at Paragalacticon during its orbit. Okay, um, so this is, the satellites are important just for tracking the process and how the gas is stripped. Um, the other thing the satellites are important for is just telling us there is a halo medium out to large radii, right? Um, so that we start to constrain relative distribution of the halo medium with distance from the Milky Way. Um, but the other thing to consider, right, is that we are part of a group. Okay, so what is, going on in terms of there being a local group halo medium and what role can that play? What can we learn about it from the satellites, for instance, and, and also other mechanisms, although I'm gonna let other people step in with, with mentioning other mechanisms largely that we can sort out the group and galaxy medium. Okay, in terms of what we would expect for a local group halo medium, Young showed this on Monday, this is a local group simulation of NUSA et al. And I'm told that um, I had a speed collaboration with Martin Spar, and he said they were doing with Philip Richter and others I'm sure are doing simulations of local groups now. So that is great because when I, I was surprised when I was looking into the simulations that were available, I wasn't finding a lot later than this in terms of a local group simulation. But this does a nice job of showing you that depending on the temperature of the gas, you do expect this medium to extend between the galaxies and surrounding it, et cetera. Um, so you have to expect that this medium would also play a role in stripping dwarf galaxies. So that's what we considered. We considered, do, does this extended local group medium play a potential role in stripping the dwarf galaxies as well? This is the model that Adrian Price Whalen set up for a paper where you have these are the virial radii of M the Milky Way and M31. And then all the dwarfs are shown by the symbols, the detections and the non-detections. And then this gray line represents our local group surface that we use. So this is representing a local group virial radius. And then we examine the relationship between gas content and this local group virial radius, where we set zero as the surface, local group surface or the local group virial radius. And so what you find is indeed when, and this would be zero, so this would be the local group surface here. So these are within the local group surface, these are beyond. Um, in general, what that local group surface finds is that you do find even more of the galaxies without gas are within that local group surface. And it's about the same number that detected. So again, I mean, it's not a huge result, 85 versus 80, right? In terms of the, it, it now encompassing more of the local group galaxies without gas, but it makes sense that you would have an additional quenching role from that local group medium. So it's, it's 
some evidence potentially that there is this local group medium that is also playing a role in stripping the satellites. So one test is to consider what we see for other systems. Do we see a group medium playing a role in general? Um, and when we compare things, the Saga survey, for instance, they're finding, they're surveying galactic analogs, and they're finding that 108 of 127 satellites, or 86%, are star forming. Um, and for us, it's much, much lower, right? We have 29% star forming. So again, they don't quite have the data to look at whether ones that are in a group environment yet. And generally, most of them are very clearly not, at least in their early paper, they weren't. But this could potentially point at, okay, for some reason, the Milky Way being in a group environment is providing an additional level of quenching. And so that's why we have so many that are already quenched compared to what they're finding for other systems. The other thing I wanted to mention and the, is the work, though, in terms of thinking about excess X-ray absorption. And so far, there hasn't been any excess found along that local group axis. So in terms of, of that result, that's an interesting counter to there being uh, an abundant local group medium within the hot gas that's probed there. And I have a student thinking about what you find for other systems this year. She just started her work at Columbia, and she's looking at what do we find for local spirals? Let's look at the gas content of local spiral, the satellites around local spirals, and see if we can distinguish if there's a difference between what we find for the Milky Way and the local group. Okay, I'm. Uh, how much time do I have, Ben? Um, you have about. I, I would say you you have 15 minutes, up to. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay, that seems like too much, but. Okay, I, 14 so, minutes. <laughs> yeah. Well, I yeah. I can let it. I've I've been buzzing through stuff pretty quickly, so I'm happy just to let it go to discussion. But since I do have a little bit more time, I will say something about the insight into the magnetic field part. Um, so in terms of the insight into the magnetic field, I wanted to mention some work by Avery Kim together with Susan Clark um, in looking at magnetically aligned H1 filaments going into the lower halo. Uh, Smita, do you have a question? Go ahead. Sorry, um, I, I can ask later. That's okay. You go ahead with the magnetic field thing. That's okay. okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I know you've done a lot of work on this, and I haven't referenced you, so I... I That's okay. That's comment. not a problem. Um, <laughs> so, so in terms of this, what, what I'm showing you here, this is work, uh, this was published in a, a paper, Peak et al., that presented the Galfa H1 survey, and this is Susan's, um, R, it's called the RHT analysis, that it identifies that there are H1 filamentary structures across the sky, and it, it ends up that these H1 filamentary structures are aligned with the galactic magnetic field. So this is within our galaxy. Um, so then what do we do in terms of going to the halo? Uh, before I do that, I'll go ahead and show you the beautiful data we're working with, where you can actually see, even with your eyes, that some of the structure is overall filamentary. This is the Gauss H1 data set. It's fully publicly available. I don't have the website right here, but if you search Galfa data, you'll, it'll be the first thing that comes up. Um, and you can see some of the filamentary structure even with your eyes in this map. What we're doing is we're scanning through in declination. And so initially we went through part of the plane, then now we're, we're coming from going looking overhead, and then we're going through the plane on the other side. And the different colors represent um, different velocity channels that have been included in this particular data set that is shown here. So this gives you an idea of the beautiful data we're working with. And then in terms of thinking about the filaments and tracking it into the halo, as, as we've already talked about, we do have neutral hydrogen gas extending into the halo. So do those features actually show some level of these H1 filaments? And then do those H1 filaments also track the magnetic field as you go up into the halo? This is the idea behind this. Uh, this is the plot that shows that what you see in terms of the local gas in the H1 filaments, that it traces the plane of sky magnetic field. And so this is showing you a plot that's showing you the orientation of the magnetic field as determined from the, the alignment of the H1 filaments. The white are the starlight polarization. So you can see overall 
their their angle is is tracing the same direction as these contours. And then here below is the magnetic field orientation from Planck. And here you can see again that there's overall they're following the main the, the neutral hydrogen filaments are following the orientation of the magnetic field. And what Susan has done is taken this into CMB foreground world heavily as well, given that Planck is noise dominated at high latitude. You can use the H1 filaments as a probe of what's going on with the magnetic field and foreground magnetic field removal um, in terms of um, trying to get that right for CMB experiments. So what we've developed is a way to actually, the, the, the initial analysis just is looking across the sky and finding overall alignment. What we've developed is a way to catalog these filaments as 3D structures because we do have that velocity information available as well. And so looking overhead, we find this local population. So again, if you're within about 10 kilometers per second, you're within, you know, you're close to the sun. You're in that layer of gas that's above our sun. But going beyond that, you, I, we also see this peak here. And this represents filaments that are in an intermediate velocity cloud that's above us. In particular, this is the IV spur which has a distance constraint of about 0.3 to 2.1 kiloparsecs. And these are showing you some of these higher velocity filaments that we're seeing as we go into this IV spur. So this is exciting in terms of a potential way to probe the magnetic field as you go higher into the halo. So this, this is work we're working on right now, but I wanted to mention that there's already a sign that we see this magnetic field going up into the halo. This is what I'm showing here are diagrams. This is somewhat complicated, but what you're seeing here are work from Pano, Panopolu et al. in 2019. And these are stars at different distances. And so the first group of stars is before both clouds, second group of stars after just one cloud, third group of stars through both. And then you compare the starlight polarization angles for the stars in the different groups. And you find that there's a clear contribution from the IVC of having aligned, aligned dust grains within the intermediate velocity cloud that is affecting the starlight polarization in this most distant group. Um, so this is clearly showing that there is signatures of a magnetic field going into at least the lower halo. We're talking within a few kiloparsecs for these intermediate velocity clouds. And there's also a very recent paper that correlated uh, Planck polarization data, both the frequency and polarization data, looking towards halo clouds, you definitely saw that the polarization data was being affected as you looked towards directions that had halo clouds. Um, so this is exciting in terms of thinking about the halo and how it extends into the lower halo and also maybe in local galaxies. So as I showed you this before, this is the Galpha data where I've highlighted some filaments within the small Magellanic cloud where we actually have some independent measurements of the magnetic field. So we can do a test, at, are these filaments at larger scales probing the magnetic field structure? And then this is important. There's evidence of halo magnetic field already from the rotation measure studies. Young mentioned one of the recent ones. McClure Griffiths et al. has one in terms of the leaning arm. And then Brian can refer you to other papers as well. Okay, so I'm gonna end there. I gave you a whirlwind tour of what the Milky Way tells us about the CGM. I didn't expect to get through everything, but I can feel that I had a lot of coffee this morning. I've been talking pretty quickly. Um, so I think it would be best if we go to the panel now and your questions and see if we can get some more insight into what the Milky Way helps tell us about the CGM. Thank you, Mary. That was that was great. Um, uh, the, the Slack chat has been populating with a lot of comments. Um, we are going to take uh, a break until 10 o'clock to convene the panel. I should say um, uh, that was a great talk. I made one, one um, mistake in the introduction uh, talking about your 2012 paper, Mary, your review. I thought Jess was on that. Um, and she I, I'm fine it. giving her credit. That's <laughs> but it was Ryan Young. I didn't well. reference her enough in this, yeah. this talk. So. <laughs> so Ryan Young, Josh Peak, and you. Um, yeah, great review. All right, so um, uh, we're going to uh, convene the panel at 10 a.m., so six minutes. Um, we'll or see 9 a.m. or whatever your time zone. 9 a.m., Mountain Time. Thank you. Yes, on the hour. <laughs>